Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everyone. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and uh, we're with Jeff Fielder today. Jeff's one of my favorite players. His um, The work he's done with Mark Lanigan, Mark, if you know Mark's name or not, he's originally started a band called Screaming Trees, which is when I first started following him. But um, Jeff's work with Mark is like hauntingly like amazing. You know, he, he's just, you know, he's a great guitar player. He's got beautiful melodies and he, and his tone is awesome. Uh, he's based out of Seattle. He's currently working with like actually a wide range of artists and he's uh, establishing himself as a go-to session and touring player band leader, arranger, and producer, and we'll talk about each of those things. He started playing guitar at age nine, influenced by his three older brothers, and he took to music pretty naturally. He fronted bands all through junior high and high school, playing guitar and bass, and also because there was no one else to do it, he was always the lead singer usually. After high school, he had a short but influential stint at the Art Institute of Seattle, and he immersed himself in the Seattle music scene. He met Dave Abrazis, who is the uh, Pearl Jam drummer from 91 to 94 did i get his last name right yeah that was yeah. easy yeah. Did it. yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was a major step for jeff he spent hours in uh, abrazis's studio in seattle and was invited to la to play for the first time with some major cats in the following years jeff worked as a bartender he spent time as a front man of the seattle band sunday morning music and he also released a solo record called last disguise in 2006, Jeff met Sarah Cahoon. He played on her first album and toured with her to promote that record. He's played on all of her albums since then. He then met Isabel Campbell, formerly of Bell and Sebastian, who asked him to play with her and help her with arrangements on the third Mark Lanigan record, which was called Hawk, H-A-W-K. Uh, Campbell, Lanigan, and Jeff then toured all over the world promoting it. As that project was winding down. Mark then asked Jeff to do some two-man shows together, and eventually Jeff became Mark's full-time touring guitarist, going on to record with Mark on the albums Imitations and Phantom Radio, and I would really encourage you to check them out. There's some just incredibly good music on there, and he also appeared on the last season of uh, the late Anthony Bourdain show, Parts Unknown, and I'll tell you to check that out, too. That was a really cool episode, man. Yeah, it was beautiful, man. It was, yeah. it was, it was a little dark, though, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. You it's know, what made it beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah it was a little dark. Um, yeah. Over the years, Jeff's continued working with Seattle music community from Star Anna and Wayne Horvitz to Stone Gossard, again from Pearl Jam, and Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses. Along with Duff, Jeff was an integral part of the band featured in the documentary and concert film called It's So Easy and Other Lies. A record Jeff produced in 2012 for the phenomenal Seattle-based songwriter called Lindsay Fuller caught the attention of Dave Matthews and Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls. Jeff wound up touring with Amy Ray and collaborated with her on her solo album, Goodnight Tender, as well as her most recent record called Holler, which was released this month, and the band, which Jeff also co-produced, and the band is currently or about to start a nationwide tour. And I just want to thank Ian Moore for uh, connecting me and Jeff. Dude, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate yeah, your time. Yeah, man. All right. Here we are. So, um, first of all, <laughs> congratulations. Jeff just got married. and he's still That's true. Ma- and he's still married four weeks later. Yeah, so happy it's only to hear. Been a man. month. I, it was, so far, so good. That's nice, man. Is that your first, <laughs> second, third? Yes, yes, first. Good for you, man. Congratulations, there. Held out for the right one. <laughs> um, Art Institute. It, it sounds like you started going there and then you left. What was what was the deal with that? It, yeah, just, man. It was the er, it, it was the early nineties. I graduated high school in nineteen ninety three, and went directly to the Art Institute. And it was a trip. I mean, it was cool. It's really expensive. If you probably heard that. Oh yeah, those things are expensive. Yeah. But it was in this in this, in this strange time where we had one class which was the recording engineering class, and uh, we had the old board. It was Steve Miller's gear. That's what the you know, <laughs> really? was 
recorded on this on this board and it was like ooh wow you know and it was tape machines and and uh you know and that kind of thing and we were learning how to cut tape with a razor blade and that was all cool you know and then we had this other class that was talking about the internet and how computers were taken over and uh you know and HDTV <laughs> For some reason, she was hung up on this HDTV thing. That that was going to be the first thing. But the internet was brand new. Uh, And um, that recording class didn't have a computer in the entire program, you know? Wow. And there was a group of us that were like, man, we're going to graduate this this thing and be dinosaurs, man. You know what I mean? And be $100,000 in debt. (laughs) Exactly, you know? And the more I kind of started investigating, I mean, it was cool. Another thing was that we were, uh, there was probably 30 people in that engineering class, you know, and one guy would come turn the, the knob on the console or whatever like that. And I was just like, I think, I don't know. I just don't think this is going to be worth it. I think it's better, you know, and I, yeah. the, the more I got into it and, and talking to people that worked in studios and engineers and whatever, it's just like, you should just intern if you want to do this, you know what yeah. I mean? Get in there and, and make some records and, you know, it's just a better education. So I kind of took all that to heart and, and dropped out or I just like didn't come back after the break and, um, and just got in it, you know? Uh, just kind of dove into the the whole scene. And another thing about the Art Institute is that they always needed talent. You know what I mean? They always need somebody on the other side of the glass playing the guitar, or playing the drums mm. for the students to record. And I was always that guy. You uh, know okay. I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always the guy that volunteered uh, to to be recorded. You know. And so it just you know it was just one of those things. It was a cool experience, but it just didn't seem like. Uh, it was going to be worth it. I give you credit for doing that because as a student, you often don't feel, you know, you're, you're with people that are in theory and I'm saying in quotes, right. You know, smarter, wiser, more experienced than you and you're there to learn. So I think that took some balls and, and a lot of awareness and confidence to sort of say, you know, these guys are supposed to be teaching me, but I think this is not a good value or this is just not, you know, there, I'm not going to be better for this. I, I really give you credit for doing that. Man. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It was a trip because it was like, um, you know, it was such a transitional time right there, you yeah. know, and really knew what was going to happen with, you know, I don't, th- I, I don't know uh, if pro tools was invented yet or yeah. anything. I'm, I bet there was a, a version of it, uh, but nobody was using it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Everybody was still on tape and uh, we knew that that was just not going to, you know, I think that I don't know how to cut tape. <laughs> okay. That's like, you know, saying I don't know how to cut slice bread either. I mean, it's not like <laughs> skill set you but, need. You know, so there, you know, there would have been probably a benefit to be hanging out there. But um, I don't know. You know, it, it, it worked out okay. Well, you got to yeah. figure if Steve Miller gave them their equipment, is something wrong with the dire- You know, if Steve didn't need it any longer, maybe there's something wrong with the direction they're going in. So good for yeah, you, man. Yeah. Honestly, I'll give you credit. Okay, good, good. Um, Lanigan, Mark Lanigan's a pretty complex musician, and I mean that in a good way as far as the music he yeah. puts together. It's really yeah. very melodic. He's a deep dude. And, and from what I read, maybe in a complex person. And I was curious, what are some of the more important takeaways or the things you learned from your experience working with him? Well, um, it's kind of an extension of, of uh, working with a lot of different songwriters is, um, you know, finding out how to um, support them in the best way. Uh, a lot of times and how we kind of started playing together, at least with him as a solo artist, which is just the two of us, you know, and he doesn't play an instrument. So I'll have to provide the entire musical landscape, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, and make it not a boring kind of acoustic show or anything like that. Um, so the idea there is to support him and what he does. He's an extraordinary singer, an extraordinary vocalist, just the kind of timbre yeah. of his voice. Oh, his and voice so- is like, uh, it's so like you know right. he you know he could either like scare the shit out of you lull you to sleep i mean it's like it's but all yeah, of the above. yeah yeah all the above for sure man. <laughs> beautiful nightmare yeah yeah um but yeah the challenge there was to uh to um you know support it to, to support his voice properly you know and over the years i kind of figured out you know how to do that fill the room with music make it sound like you don't, you're not missing the band, you know? Yeah. And so there's a, there's a lot of ambience, you know, it's very rhythmic. 
Um, you know, there, I, uh, when I play with him solo, it's it's all finger picked, um, and um, a lot of reverb and a lot of just kind of you know, it's it's very natural sound. I, I don't use too many effects or anything like that, but um, it's just kind of to come up with this kind of ethereal, you know, uh, sound. And, uh, you know, just try to fill up all the space, you know, it's a big tone that I use for that, for that particular, uh, gig, you know, what are you generally using P nineties and, uh, you know, yeah. I was going to ask you that. What are you typically playing on that gig? Uh, I have a 64, um, SG special. Wow. That's kind of main, main ride with him. Yeah. That's the one that's in the, uh, Bourdain episode. And it's got P nineties and what amp are you playing through? Um, I have a couple, uh, the, the amp that I, my amp that I want everything else to sound like is a bandmaster. It's a, again, I think it's a 63 or a 64, whatever year they made the blonde Tolex with the blackface amp. Um, and I've got a, one of those reverb tanks on sitting on top of it, like well, the old reverb tank. But, uh, so the combo that I found that's the closest to it was a tone King. You know, that guy, he's out of Baltimore. Yeah. Yes, I know who he is. I don't. I don't know him, but I know the al- the albums. I know the amps. Yeah, yeah, it was one of his first ones. It was like a 2008 Meteor 40, and uh, it's a great amp. You know, 112, uh, big solid cabinet, and uh, yeah, I love that amp. Um, it's interesting because when I've I've listened to a number of the videos of you guys, and you know, you could hear reverb, and I think maybe a little tremolo at times. Yeah. Um, but it's tough because you. It, it it would be real easy to like have that, you know, that's your thing. Every song, it's kind of, it's hard to do what you do where you have the, you know, you're controlling it, but you're not doing the same thing every song. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's another challenge of that is trying to make everything, you know, there's an arc to the show. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, you know, and, and most of that is in the fingers and just kind of the way of, of, of playing it. But the, you know, there are a few little tricks in there, you know, a fuzz pedal on occasion and uh um some delay and things like that you know what i mean it's yeah pretty, pretty pretty simple setup but um it's more of just the way to, to just selling it you know I and mean, we opened up for nick cave in oh theaters, you know for on cool. run. and uh filling up those theaters was a you know that was a it's, it's scary but um you know because i'm the only guy yeah i forget a chord which has happened or, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, lose it for a second. You know, I, I tend to get pretty nervous. <laughs> are, are, but people are pretty, I think people are pretty forgiving though, no? I don't know. I'm, I'm so in my own head. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, a bad note will ruin a month for me, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I, I understand that, but let me tell you, man, the only time <laughs> pe- like the biggest critics that in my observation of anything, not just music, the people who are the most critical are the people who are doing the least of anything. I mean, they're fucking in their mom's basement or, you know, on a computer or something like that. I mean, seriously, sure, right? you know, yeah, because yeah. people who are actually out there doing stuff, they like, they realize how complicated things are, how difficult the, the art of doing X, Y, and Z. And mm-hmm. that, you know, it's statistically impossible to be perfect all the time. I mean, literally yeah. statistically it's, you know, um, <laughs> So, you know, and we yeah. get like, we get critics. Thank goodness. Most people are very nice with me, but I, I mean, I'll have people put wacky comments on like, you know, uh, why do you say thank you so much? <laughs> right, right, right. And I don't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. even understand what that, I don't, you know, like, okay, you know, that's cool. Whatever next. But, uh, yeah, yeah I think most people realize that things take effort, man. And pretty forgiving. Yeah. Um, well, most people on the internet are, you know, everybody's a critic. And so, you know. right. And you got to remember that too. So go out and do some shit and then come back yeah, and tell exactly. me how easy yeah. it is, Mr. Critic. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, I just see, I saw someone, <laughs> I got an email from someone. They said, I'm a podcast critic. And I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. I mean, yeah, give me a break. Yeah, okay. Where'd you get? Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's like, I'm a child birthday party critic. Yeah. Anyway, um, man, you've been involved in a lot of different things. And I was curious, this is a tough question. Can you pick like maybe top three experiences you've had musically either, you know, because of the work you did or the richness of the experience or the hang, you know, the personalities, whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, 
There's been a couple with Mark that have been really extraordinary. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that Anthony Bourdain show uh, for one of those. That was a big deal. Um, just getting to have dinner with the guy. You know what I mean? Just like on the, you know, just sit there and talk. The, the way that he operated on that show, the, 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 the way that that came about was that he wrote a, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a review or it, it was very kind uh, words about Mark Mark's book. He wrote a book of uh, poetry and, and, and lyrics and some of it was unpublished and whatnot. Um, and him and Bourdain were friends and uh, Mark had done the uh, theme song to the, to the show. Oh, I didn't know that. Very cool. Yeah, totally. Wait a minute. And that the, like, the theme song he uses? Yeah. The thing in the beginning? Well, yeah, um, that's like, yeah. That's Mark. You know what? Man, now yeah. that you say it, I could totally get that. Yeah. Pop yeah. popsicle, right? That one, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, shit. That's right. I could see that. So anyway, he wrote, he wrote this beautiful uh, uh review of the book and and uh, and then he goes, "Hey man, I'm going to do a show in Seattle. You got to be on it. You have to be on it." And he felt obligated to do it because he wrote such a nice hmm. uh, piece about his book. He would never do TV, you know. He just he just doesn't want to do it for whatever reason. He doesn't like looking at himself, or <laughs> I don't. I don't really. I, I know. totally get it, man. But he did. He did do it. He put me in charge of uh, of dealing with the whole thing. So I kind of I dealt with the the the, um, the producers, and I set up the places for us to go, and the, that whole bit. You know what I mean? The sushi up- place. That was you. Uh, the, j- no, we were at a, a tapas place. Top w- w- was okay. The last it was called Ocho. It's okay. Ocho, Seattle, everybody. Ocho. It's a, a Spanish tapas. And, and as soon as I heard that we were doing uh, parts unknown, it was my mission in life to get my buddy's restaurant on that show. <laughs> there you go, man. And we pulled it off kind of last minute. So that was definitely a, a highlight. Um, another one is, um, being able to play with uh, Tedeschi trucks band in Boston. It was, it was Susan's, um, birthday and they asked me to sit in with the band we uh with amy ray we opened for them we have kind of the same okay. uh um brian spicer who's the producer of our both our records that we've done together is their front of house guy oh okay and so we're very closely connected at this point pretty closely connected to the tedeschi trucks band and Derek trucks is uh you know obviously you know Oh, I've seen him in concert. It's Super and I've seen him with the brothers. Favorite. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pretty, pretty so, incredible. So that was a big deal. Um, and then there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. I got to jam with Joe Walsh. What was that and, about? Um, that was. Uh, it's kind of like it's kind of hard to explain. There's a private party, and this dude uh, has a lot of bread, <laughs> and he's able to invite his heroes. You know what I mean? Hey, God uh, bless and, him. And then I get uh, to be in the house band every once in a while. Very know? cool. So through that, I've got to jam with Robbie Robertson, and then uh, uh, you know, and uh, like I said, Joe Walsh got to do uh, Chain Gang with um, with uh, Chrissy Hind. That was a big deal. That's really cool. Um, but you know, I don't know. I think that a transformative moment was when I was a kid. Uh, and I had never played in front of an audience before. I did like recitals and things like that, but um, did this talent show in seventh grade when I was still in Alaska. And um, it was one of those things where the curtain opened, mm-hmm. you know, they couldn't see us. We were behind the curtain and we were doing come together. I think the Beatles, you know, in seventh grade, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah. No, it's pretty was, yeah, ambitious, was, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I was listening to uh, Miles Davis when I was in sixth grade. <laughs> I was really into music. Yeah, we're going to talk about that next. But, <laughs> but uh, anyways, the curtain opened and then everybody freaked out. And there was all these girls like standing on the, it was like in this theater in the school, you know, and that it just like, that was the first time I had felt that feeling, you know, yeah. so oh, play in a band and we'll sing these songs. But I didn't know what to expect from the audience like that and getting that energy, yeah. you know, and then hearing the the loudness of the PA, you know, because we were all mic'd up. I mean, it was kind of a pro gig, you know, for a talent show. Sure. You know, drums, bass, two guitars. And neither of us wanted to sing, uh, me and the other guy. So we sang it together, you know, sort of in unison, you know. But that, I'll never forget that day. That was amazing. And we had to wait around the whole talent show. It was like two and a half hours because we played at the very end, you know. It's a great and story, so, man. It's just like, oh, come on. And we finally did it. And uh, from that day, I was like, this is all I ever want to do. 
you know, yeah. Let, let me ask you, take one step back. You've played with guys like um, Derek, Joe Walsh, Robbie Robertson, Chrissy Hine. Is, I'm assuming at this point in time, you just approach them like they're anybody else. Like they were the, you know, not to obviously to, to take away, but no different than you were in seventh grade playing with your buddy as the other guitar player. Mm, I wouldn't go that, that far, no. I mean, like I have a healthy respect for these people. Right. And so, you know, it's a, it is a different thing. Like, it's kind of a humbling experience. You know what I mean? Like, and, and having, I mean, Derek and me and Derek are around the same age, you know? Yeah. And so there's not necessarily that thing where it's like, if you meet Joe Walsh or, or, uh, you know, I met David Crosby once and it's like, whoa, you're kind yeah. of meeting, you know, oh. guys from the Bible or something. Yeah. <laughs> like that. It's sure. Like, Jesus, man. <laughs> uh, but you know, when, when Derek, who's, anointed you know the, the 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 guy i mean he's definitely carrying on without question um uh, what Dwayne has done and you know and not in playing style but just like he's you know he's in the league with with clapton and jeff beck and those guys yeah, you know absolutely I mean? and so you know if he asks you to sit in then you know that's a that's a big that's a big deal it's it was a, a big, big deal movie. yeah and yeah absolutely but you're not yeah. i'm I, I guess one of the the question is you're not like I would you're probably not intimidated you're just respectful I because you play you, yeah I mean, not, you've been doing this a long time necessarily intimidated yeah though, that's what you know I mean yeah. yeah I mean it's just it, it you know and yeah I, I think I get what you're saying yeah uh, you know in that way it's just you know it's just rock and roll music you know yeah. we all come from the same place you know I bet you know we have the same records you know yeah we, we, you know we have the a lot you know the, of the same experiences and things like that you know mm. so in that way I, I i'd feel more comfortable with somebody like that than maybe you know a lot of people just on the street you know sure sure because we share that you know that thing even though we kind of come from different places what um, was what was was robbie part of that private party thing also it was a different thing I mean, it's all tied in with the emp down here or they call it the mopop uh uh museum now but it's basically a rock and roll museum in seattle okay Okay. And a lot of that stuff is tied in with that, you know, and they'll do an awards ceremony every year for somebody. And there was one year with Robbie Robertson was, uh, he doesn't was, play out very much. As far as, no, I mean, I don't see so that was cool. You know what I mean? I got to play, uh, cripple Creek with him. You know that's I mean? so cool, man. <laughs> yeah. That's really wild. And you're playing with the guy who wrote it too. That's so, uh, yeah, yeah that's really cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned you were into miles Davis at, in sixth grade. So you yeah. had three older brothers turning you on to music. Is that, I mean, that's really unusual to be listening to Miles Davis when you're like, whatever, 11 or something like that. All right. Yeah. Uh, there was a bunch of influences when I was a kid that, um, had a large impact on my just life in general. Um, uh, same parents, they had three kids. Uh, they're from Texas. Um, they had three kids right away out of high school. So they're about a year apart mm -hmm. or so, you know, um, and you know, all before they were 21. Oh, wow. Or, Holy crap. See what I mean? That's kind of the way it went back then. You know, that's a lot of work. Uh, and then, wow. And then they waited 13 years after my, the, my youngest brother out of the three is 13 years older than me, you know? Uh, and then I don't know, I don't know the story on that, but then I came along and then sure. I have a younger sister also. And so it's kind of like, there's two sets of kids yeah, all from the same parents, you know? But so when I was a little kid, uh, you know, three or four, there was these three long haired dudes <laughs> hanging around all the time. You know what I mean? And they listened to rock music and they partied, you know, they were just they were dudes. You know? And so that was kind of my biggest male influence. I mean, my, my dad was cool, but I had these three guys, you know, and so the whole, you know, and my brother had a uh, my brother, Brian, had a Les Paul deluxe like a gold top oh wow and then my brother mark had a 76 strap that i still have it's right here man that is that really cool gave. you have your that's great yeah and so they were just always kind of playing and you know getting home late from the gig and that kind of thing you know what i mean and uh i liked the, their bell bottoms and their long hair and mark had a trans am you know they were just cool yeah. you know what i mean and listen rolling stones and and Jethro Tull. I remember like hearing uh, Aqualung when I was four years old. It was the scariest thing yeah. I ever heard in my life. It was so frightening. But then, uh, you know, at the same time, I was like really fascinated by it, you know? You know and what? 
time I was nine, nine, you know, I was, you know, they were like, well, you got to take up a musical instrument. And it was a no brainer. And I was like, oh, I'll play guitar for sure. You know? Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So you had some very strong, uh, and very close influences. That's really yeah. They were just there all the time hanging around. You know, it's funny. And the other thing that happened was that, um, um, I did a talent show in sixth grade. Um, and then in the summer in between sixth and seventh grade going into junior high, um, the music teacher at the, at the grade school, uh, mentioned me, uh, to the music teacher at the junior high that I was going to go to. And I got a call from this guy. His name was Randy McCartney, uh, in the middle of the summer. And he goes, I'm the music teacher that's going to be at the junior high. Uh, and I have a, I have a community jazz band. It's some of the guys from the junior high, it's some of the guys from the high school. And then some people just from around town and he was a drummer and we need a bass player. And I go, well, I don't play bass. And I was, uh, how old are you when you're in sixth grade? 11? Uh, 11. And 11. And I go, well, I don't play bass. And he goes, well, why don't you come down to the school, have your mom take you down to the school, and I'll, I'll show you around how to play bass. And he had a, uh, we did, I went down there, and he had a big Gibson Gripper bass, you know, <laughs> it was bigger than me, and a PB amp. And he sat there and showed me how to hold it. And he showed, I'd never read music because I'm basically self taught. And um, he showed me how to reef bass clef and just gave me all these assignments and gave me all these jazz records. And I didn't know any of that stuff. And I was so um, uh, ready to learn that I took all this stuff really seriously. And I went home and played bass for two weeks. And the first time that I played with other people was in that jazz band with a, I think it was a nine piece horn section. It wow. was like, whoa man you know what i mean yeah it was serious and then i like so the one instrument that i've actually trained on is is bass and it's thanks to this this guy and being your first time playing in a band being in the rhythm section playing bass with a really he's an excellent drummer you know with all of these guys and really complex material was a huge step forward you know and it was only that one year that i played with them oh and i learned how to play drums in the concert band so That's then i was so playing. cool Drum. By the end of seventh grade, I could play all these different instruments, and I was really, really into it. And then we moved to Washington, and then now it all stopped. The the, the music teachers uh, here didn't want anything to do with me because I looked like a rocker. They thought I was a bad seed or whatever like that. Uh, and this was and in Alaska. The, well, the first thing was in Alaska, and then we moved after seventh grade. We moved to Washington. Okay. Uh, outside of Seattle, and then that school was horrible. All, all the all the schools I went to or at least my experiences were really, really not so great in, in Washington. That's but that too one bad teacher, because you had such a great. Yeah. 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 That, uh, do any of your brothers play music? They do. All three of them do. Um, ne never really professionally. The closest uh, that came to doing that was my middle brother. And, you know, he still plays, he, you know, he plays guitar and bass. His name's Brian, Brian Fielder represent Wasilla, Alaska. He's still up there. <laughs> uh, 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 but, um, yeah, no, I was just playing in bars and stuff and playing old, you know, rock tunes. Do you know Rick you know? Holmstrom? No. Nah. He's a guy from Alaska, actually. Oh, yeah. And I think he still lives there, if I'm... Okay. Yeah, and he plays with Mavis Staples. He's a little older oh, than me. Oh, yeah, man. The yeah, guitar. Yeah, the guitar is Rick Holmstrom. I know he, what you're talking about. Yeah. I didn't know he was from Alaska. Yeah, yeah. he's from Alaska. And I, I'm pretty okay. sure he still lives there. Why would he still live there? I, I don't. <laughs> hey, he loves out? it. No, he loves it there. It's you know, it's right. like um, like another guy. Do you know? He's a young, much younger guy named David Meyer. He plays with Don Felder. He's from Alaska. Oh, yeah, cool. And okay, he's, yeah, he lives cool. in Nashville now, but he's originally from there. It's yeah, this, uh, this big Alaska. I've met more people from well, Alaska since I've been doing this show than like in the fifty-four years before that, man. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. Well, there's not much else to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Play music and like. You know, ski. You, you I don't guess. Ski. Yeah, yeah. I never skied. Um. <laughs> very cool. What 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 kind of work did your folks do during this time? Uh, my my dad um, uh, built houses. That's when we ended up in Alaska because uh, in the early seventies. Before that, nobody was really living up there, and then they built that pipeline. You know. Oh, so okay. All of a sudden, or whatever, you know. And so uh, he moved the, the whole family up there. Uh, and built there's there's uh neighborhoods where he him and his crew which were mostly my brother brian and a couple guys uh built every single house in that neighborhood that's <laughs> really cool man it was a total boom and then by the by the you know the end of the 80s it, that was all over 
at least, you know, for the, the housing thing and building mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, so that's why we moved to, to, um, uh, Washington. My mom was just a housewife. Well, five kids. Yeah. You know, um, and then, um, she volunteered and she was always at my school and stuff like that. I, I love my mom. That's great. Uh, and my dad just up and split one day after all of that, you know, after all those kids, he just lit like literally disappeared. You're you kidding know? me. Yeah. How? And then, and then, oh my God. Uh, I was 16 and, you know, and my mom figured out, you know, with no help, you know, he never sent any checks to us or anything like that. He just up and gone. And Has he ever like reached out, out to any of you? Uh, you have to go find him. I've, I've went and found him a couple of times. He's out in Texas. You know what I mean? But holy cow, man, I'm yeah. sorry. That's like, it's all right. You know, I, d- I don't hold any sort of grudge. At least I don't think, to, <laughs> I don't think I do. That's I, but she that's figured cool. out how to, uh, she figured out just, she needed to figure something out. She, uh, learned how to be a bookkeeper. And she went to work and it was me and my sister and her and she supported us all through that rest of the time that we were at home. And um, and then we had to move out of the house. And so um, I was like, well, I'll just get my own place, you know, because I always worked. I always had yeah. a job since I was I mean, I used to work on the job site when I was nine, ten. Sure. And then as soon as I could, I, I got a job. So I, I was always pretty self uh, yeah. sufficient i bought my guitars and things like that um uh so i moved out relatively early i think i was 17 or 18 uh and it wasn't because you know i moved in the same complex as as my mom she was just right down the thing but um yeah i mean so that was all that experience you know wow it's, that's it's kind of weird because i i know what it's like to um to have a, a lot of kind you know not we weren't rich by any means but you know we you know we were okay everything sure. was fine and then we were just poor, you know, and then we were OK, you know, and then I was the popular kid at school and then I'd move and then I was the total, total nerd that everybody hated at school. And so when I you had like the, yeah. all those extreme experiences like, you know, so I think when you have that, though, it really gives you a set of wisdom and like you, you can kind of like empathize a lot better with a lot of broader absolutely. range of people. man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, totally. Um, wow, that's freaking all. just would, did that episode was that like in the back of your mind as far as like ever getting married is that why you think you took a long time to make sure because i mean i would imagine something like that it would freak i mean that's a weird shit to have to think about <laughs> i was in a relationship for a very very long time there uh 17 years oh wow uh, before, before i met tecla my wife yeah uh, and so that was it was kind of like a marriage it's just what yeah. you never you never did the uh, the ceremony and we talked about it a little bit um but you know to be honest i was i was uh uh looking back on that you know i just wasn't ready i just didn't feel like it was it was necessary for whatever yeah. reason i don't know i don't know what exactly it was yeah sure um uh and then that all you know that was a pretty painful breakup is just because of the the mileage you know oh, on that 17 you know, years long of, time to be somebody yeah, yeah absolutely very much. um and i met tecla shortly after that you know probably a year or so after that whole thing and it was a completely different experience like i was just like i knew right away i mean almost the, the day that we not the day we met but the day that we hung out we there was a day that we kind of met up and just hung out just to you know kind of meet each other it wasn't even like a date or anything like that she played music she wanted to yeah. pick my brain about maybe you know gigs or something like that and from that day on i just i knew it was a completely different thing you know and so <laughs> i couldn't wait to get married that's you know? nice man you know? yeah it's funny how that is your boyfriend you know what i mean <laughs> yeah well, good for you so, man i'm really happy yeah. for you guys that's very nice yeah, thanks yeah you know what um i remember when i got divorced i was married very young and then it was really i, I met my wife real quick and I remember my buddy saying, "Hey, that's the next Mrs. X Garber. You know that." <laughs> and I, and I just said, "Okay, whatever." And uh, fuck, twenty six years later, we're still here, man. Yeah. So yeah, that's so, great. Man. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That, twenty six that, years. That's a long ass time. And for her to be with me that long, it's like probably maybe like hundred twenty six years on her end. Do that on her. She's easy. Wow, good story, man. Thank you for sharing that. Really nice. All right. Absolutely, man. Nice. Yeah. Um, you're a very diverse player. I mean, you, you could play anything and you do play everything. Is there like a particular style of music you would 
tend to gravitate to playing if you had no, you know, if you weren't a side man and then if you weren't producing or, you know, what would you want to do? Yeah, that's an interesting question because um, uh, there's a couple of different ways I can answer that. I was at that band that you mentioned, Sunday Morning Music, right? Hmm. That band was an awesome band. But we didn't have an identity because we wanted to do our, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then, you know, some of it was really funky. And then over there, it was like kind of a country vibe, you know, and then there was all this. So it was confusing, I think, to people <laughs> uh, because I want to do whatever I'm either. I either want to do exactly what I'm doing at the time or I'm feeling like what I'm doing at the time. I wish I was doing this other thing. Does that make sense? I'm always I'm, I, I can't pick one thing that I would like to do over the other, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, oh, I do um, get that. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think that the, uh, if you can do a lot of different types of music, um, I think it's because you, you know, you want to, it's kind of like listening to music, you know, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't listen to one type of, you know, thing all that I love ACDC. But I can't listen to ACDC all day, mm. every day. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I totally it's get just, that. You know what I mean? I gotta have, I gotta have something else. I love country music. I love country music. Uh, you know, a lot. Like you know, real country music. Um, like Western swing kind of stuff. Well, I love Western swing and Bob Wills and and uh, but you know the the the, uh, the early Nashville stuff. Um, and uh, you know, once you get into um, you know, you get into the the Austin guys, kind of the outlaw guys, their yeah. early things when they were trying to fit into that Nashville sort of, you know, those early Waylon Jennings records are, are fantastic, you know. And then all the stuff through the 70s, that's a no brainer. You know, Willie and Waylon and, uh, you know, the 60s with Johnny Cash and, and uh, you know, all that stuff, you know, is, is, is great. Great, great players. You know, I love Buck Owens. Oh, what a player, yeah. man. Yeah, uh, Merle Haggard's a big deal for me, you know, and all that stuff. Um, but see, you, you know what I mean? And then it just goes, it, rock and roll is endless, you know, the, 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 the stuff. You know, it's kind of like asking, oh, what's your favorite uh, band or your favorite guitar player? It's impossible for me to ask answer that question, you know. Well, I'm going to ask you that later, so, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just to put, warn you. Um, <laughs> so really, you, so I totally get it. So you're just, you enjoy so much, you don't, you know, it's like you don't want to almost pick one. Yeah. And I always want to keep learning. I mean, when Amy, I've, like I said, I was really into country music, but Amy wanted to make this uh, country record. And I was like, OK, well, I got to get into this because I didn't really consider myself a country guitar player. So I spent about, I don't know, you know, I don't really practice all that much. <laughs> I just kind of play. But you don't stop playing, I don't think. I either. play every yeah, day, yeah. all day. Yeah. I mean, I, I play a lot, you know, just but Just that's practicing. I think like practice is, for yeah. some people thinking like practice to me is fret time. You know, that's what practice right, is. I absolutely. mean, it doesn't matter almost what you're doing because you're getting better just by, you know, I think uh, oftentimes people think practice means like I got to do scales or whatever. Running scales. I yeah. never did that. Yeah. yeah. It just seemed like anti music to me. You know, you know it's mean? not fun. And music yeah. should be fun. You know, I would just like, uh, let's see, let's, we're getting off on the thing. <laughs> no, it's but, cool. like, when, when, the uh, uh when we were going to do that country record, I spent a lot of time wanting to be a legitimate country guitar player. You know what I mean? Uh, watching Vince Gill and, and uh, uh, Chet Atkins and um, Danny Gatton is such a freak. If you guys don't yeah. know who Danny Gatton is, just look him up on YouTube. He's the freakiest of the freaks, you know, Telecaster. So, you know, I got a telly and I just spent, you know, I wanted to be authentic, you know, and I think I, figured it out you know i've got my own way of doing it you know but uh you know do, do you do hot chicken picking yeah that whole really bit. yeah mm -hmm. you, now you said with mark you were doing finger picking mostly do you tend to mostly finger pick or do you use a pick you, uh, there was a time where i didn't use a pick at all for for forever because i can't do both I mean, i'm self-taught um and so i couldn't use my three other fingers i only have my first finger and my thumb you know yeah. that's all i can use for whatever reason which means i can't use a pick I wish I could use a pick and then finger pick with the other ones, you know? Right. I, I'd never figured out how to do that. So um, I was using my fingers so much and I was, you know, I was uh, developing the style to where it just seemed much more expressive to me uh, to finger pick an electric guitar. So I just got rid of, you know, and I kept on losing my picks anyway. Couldn't keep a hold of them. Uh, so there was years where I didn't play with a pick at all. And then recently 
uh, meaning in the last probably five, six years, you know, I have started to, you know, kind of be about 50, 50 with it. How, how long does it take once you stop playing with a pick and then you're just using your fingers? How long does that take till you, of of course, the more you practice, the shorter it takes, but by and large, like how many months till you're sort of like, it's not, doesn't feel like you, you're, you're still better off using a pick because you're better with it. If, if that question even makes sense. So well, the question is how, how long does it take to get comfortable not using a pick? Yeah. Because like I'm going through that now. I, 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 uh-huh. I interviewed a guy in Chicago. His name is guy King. He's a blues player. And I always like playing without a pick just cause it, you know, tactile. It feels, I like the feeling yeah, yeah. better. I feel like I, my relationship with the instrument is stronger. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but it's like harder. It's a lot harder. I mean, you, you know, for me anyway. And so yeah. he said, well, look, Craig, you know, you'll be do it for two months. You'll be better in two months. And I'm like, you know, what I'll be better. But I mean, it still feels awkward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing for me. If it ever felt awkward, uh, then I just didn't do it. Mm. And so it was really comfortable for me. So I don't I guess, uh, I, guess okay. I don't have an answer to yeah, that question. I totally like I just figured that's my if you ever see a video of me doing it, it looks very strange. I get this like like this claw thing happening. It kind of freaks people out <laughs> um, just because it looks funny because of the way the angle is. But sure. I just figured it out on my own and it just always just felt completely natural to me. Mm. And uh, I'm trying to remember there was a couple songs in the old band that um, were a kind of a chicken picking type of thing. Where's a like that kind of vibe. And um, uh, I just started playing like that all the time. Not, not that, particular style but i learned how to play any kind of guitar style with without a pick so i could so i could not have to put it down or drop it or you know what i mean yeah deal deal with that little piece of plastic on any level um now i'm a little bit more organized and also um uh i'm doing you know a lot of sessions and things like that so you know it's just another tool if if, if something calls for that then i want to have you know that available to me and that was kind of the biggest thing, you know, is that like a lot of a lot of music and a lot of guitar parts call for a pick, you know. And mm. so I just it just kind of came up, you know, and especially when I if, if I play with Mark's band if in the band rather than just the two of us, then that's a more of a uh, traditional rock guitar, um, uh, you know, role. That, and so that's almost exclusively with the pick that that whole gig, you know, uh, to, to play with the rock band. Yeah. Cool. Um, but you're super demand. I mean, you're very laid back and easygoing, but you're very demanding on your, I mean, your standards and what your, your wiggle yeah. room for yourself is pretty small. I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely yeah, yeah. small, <laughs> which is, which is great. Which I mean, as a player, I mean, that, you know, you're the guy people want to hire because of that. You well, know? Hopefully. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, well, it's like, you know, yeah, absolutely. man. Um, what were some of the lower points or biggest obstacles that you've had to deal with over your career and, and how did you manage to get through them, whether they were business, music, or personal stuff? Uh-huh. Uh, well, you know, there was, um, there was a time where I was going to quit or I felt like I wanted to just quit music altogether. Um, it just wasn't happening. You know, it was right before I met Isabel. Isabel was that brought me out of the, the depths <laughs> Isabel Campbell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's how I met Mark was through her and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, it just wasn't going anywhere, man. You know, there was like, I knew it was going to happen. Whereas, you know, well, I'm going to do this. And, uh, you know, I knew that my other friends that went to college properly, you know, I, mm. you know, they'd buy a car and then they got married and then they bought a house and then, you know what I mean? And then they sold that house and bought a bigger house. And then all that stuff was happening. And I was kind of staying in the same place. And I had a couple friends. One in particular was like, how long, how much longer are you going to do this, man? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, it's not really, you know, and, and, and my answer to him at that time was like, well, it's not really a choice. It's just, this is what I do. And whether or not it, you know, pays any bills at, guess is you know unfortunately incidental you know um but there was a time where um and seattle's kind of a weird town where it's like you know it's a music town but it's uh i don't want to talk too much shit but you know it doesn't have a lot of um uh, it doesn't want to stay in its history it doesn't want to look back i mean the the city itself you know tears down its old buildings and all that stuff and after the big grunge thing 
um, the people that came, the generation that came after that didn't want anything to do with all that stuff. You know what I mean? What, it, what, what did they want? Something else, you know? And then there was also a time where it was not cool to play guitar, you know? And if you did play guitar, it had to be real noisy and you couldn't know how to do it. You know, it was just uncool. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> you know? So if you were like, could actually play, then generally people didn't want to deal with you. You know, it, it, it seemed... I don't know what it just seemed like too slick or whatever their idea was, you know, and this is a generalization, but that's definitely what I was feeling. Um, so I just, you know, I just wasn't into it and I wasn't feeling much love and, you know, I just wanted to kind of stop doing it. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was like, I just don't know if this is it. Um, and then I met Isabel, but then also I started doing sessions around that same time. And you, it was the same, I, it was the same idea where it's like, you know, nobody really wanted a good guitar solo. So I learned how to play ugly, you know, and that was an interesting turning point. And what do you mean by that? You know how Neil Young plays ugly guitar <laughs> solo? Yeah. I kind of took that and ran with it. Um and um it changed my perception of what a, a guitar solo can be. And then, you know, uh, and then something else happened. The more session work I did, the more I was like, you know, I don't, it doesn't really matter what I think, you know, I want to make them feel good and f like the singer and the, whoever's leading the band sure. uh, to, to not worry about what's happening with the guitar. You know what I mean? Never look back and be like, Ugh, what's going on back there? You know what I mean? Always support, always, you know, and if you have a moment, you know, make it count. But, you know, it's 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 their gig, you know, and that was a that was a revelation. You know, how did you start getting session work? Um, there was a couple of buddies of mine that owned a studio. That's where I did my solo record. And people would stop by there and be like, hey, you got a guy that could do this and this. And a lot of people oh. were instrumentalists, like somebody that could do a session and do all of this stuff because they didn't want to pay four different guys or whatever. I, I, I guess, you know. And so I got those calls quite often, you know, because I could play, you know, um, because I can play slide guitar. That means I can play dobro and, and lap steel and kind of like I, I don't play pedal steel, but I can kind of fill that role. Mm. You know what I mean? And I was playing banjo and uh, electric guitar, acoustic guitar and all that stuff. So I just started being kind of this utility session guy. And the more that that started to happen, the more, you know, the more you get a reputation and the more phone calls you get, and you know. It just kind of it just kind of happens, you know. And so you you just adopted more of a service mentality, a little bit, yeah. Um, although that seems like, I mean, at the time for sure, you know. Um, but nowadays, I don't really, I'm not really down with the it's for myself the the title of side man because that 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 sounds like you're just hired just to kind of do something, you know. Everything that I'm involved with. I'm involved with, you know what I mean? I'm involved with the, you know, the, the arrangements and the, the way the band sounds and the, and the, you know, the, the overall timbre of the entire, you know, I'll sure. like write, write the set list and things like that. So I feel like I'm integral. I, I need to feel like I'm integral, you know, uh, as opposed to, I'll do gigs where I'm just hired and I just kind of play a role, but generally, you know, with Mark and with Amy Ray and Tecla's band and most things I do, um, I kind of have more of a say than your average just hired gun yeah. type of guy. Yeah. But that's because you want to. And so the, you know, it's, isn't it, a, don't you think it's like you want to do this and these people are attracted to you because of who you are. And part of that is the fact that you're going to do, uh, you're going to have this whole, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like a mutual yeah. thing, right? I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not like know. you get in there and they're like, you're a side man and you're like, uh, no, I'm not a fucking side man. I'm going to do, no. you know, like you're going to wrestle them, you know, it, they, it, they, they, they like to, you, you it know, has because, to happen naturally. Yeah. yeah they like it's you because all of that trust and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So you basically got through that by just hanging in there a little bit and then you started getting the, the, the session work and then one thing. Yeah. Well, Is Isabel called me from Scotland. <clears throat> and, uh, so the way that that happened was that, um, Isabel Campbell was in, uh, Bell and Sebastian, um, and a uh, pretty respected uh, thing. And then she did a couple solo records um, that were gorgeous, you know, that were kind of received in the UK pretty well. Uh, and then she did a record with Mark Lanigan, sort of a, a Nancy Sinatra uh, 
Lee Hazelwood type of vibe. And they got really good, you know, that was received really well. So she did a second one with Mark. And the way they would do those records was that she would record it with her guys in Scotland, send it to Mark, and he would send the vocal back. You know, it was okay. all, you know, like long distance. So she wanted to meet some American musicians. She wanted to tour America. Um, and so she came to the Folk Alliance Festival in 2008 or nine, one of those two. I wasn't there, um, but my friend Phil Hurley was. He's a great guitar player. And he was in a band, uh, and they were, you know, hot. You know, he, he he can jam and all this stuff. So she saw him, and she's like, "Oh, they, oh, maybe like you'd like to be in my band." <laughs> but Dude, you got so, the accent down. They, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he couldn't do it. He wanted to stay in his thing, and he was doing his thing. But he he suggested me, and he called me and told me, and I had that first. Is the Isabel Campbell Mark Lanigan record? And I was like, "You're kidding me!" Because I had never been asked to do anything on that level. Um, and it was about a month later, I got this really fuzzy call from Scotland. Hello. <laughs> and the next thing I know, she uh, she met me in um, Tucson because she had also met at that Folk Alliance Festival. She had met Victoria Williams. Okay, who I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with, but. Uh, it's kind of legendary. And uh, so they did some recording with Calexico in Tucson. And I was there just to hang out. And I ended up being the guitar player in that session. And so all of a sudden, you know, I went from about to quit to playing with Calexico, you know, in the, uh, the I think it was called the Sound Lab or Sonic. I forget the name of the studio. They're going to be mad at me. But anyway, <laughs> and then that whole thing just kind of started. I met Mark very soon after that and made that third record, the Hawk record. Mm. Um, and then it was just kind of on. And then the next thing I know, I'm touring with them. And that was the first time I had ever done that. I'd been to, you know, I'd toured in a van around the States in a you know dirty van, not making any bread and just being kind of destitute. And I hated touring. I thought it sucked. <laughs> Um, but they go, well, we'd like you to be in the touring band. And they sent me the dates and it was Paris and London and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was blown away. And so, you know, we did that, that whole next year. And then that's when I started kind of doing what I'm doing now, yeah. you know, it's just you know, doing a bunch of different stuff and, and, and touring all over the place. And, you know, wild, yeah, that, isn't that was it wild? Amazing. Like, like how this all happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it really is. It's just perseverance, you know, perseverance, just hanging in there, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, you, you can never <laughs> you can't connect the dots moving forward. You know, yeah. you never know what that what the you end. Can't it. Yeah, yeah. And it's always boggles my mind. And it's like inspirational to me as an outsider to to see what how the magic works, the magic of the universe. Right. man. You yeah. know, you know, like, it is a trip. It, yeah. It's really a trip, man. And it's it's yeah. um it's just amazing. I believe in all that stuff, the laws of attraction and, you know, and, and, you know, if you put it out there, you know, something's going to come back, you know, just positive energy and, you know, you got to know what you're doing. I mean, there's that Absolutely. too. You can yeah. Yeah, hack and just get the gig. Although right. some people, but <laughs> no, but by and large, you've got to know, you can't, you know, yeah, you, you can't yeah. be an idiot all the time. You know, you gotta, <laughs> you know, you've got to be doing, you know, it's funny. Cause I always, the older I get, I'm more, so much more aware of like the universe and like any kind of messages. And like, uh, if I'm thinking about something, and then like someone mentions a name or something, then I'm like, okay, now that's my cue. I got to do that. Or yeah. mentions a thing. I don't sit and wait anymore. I'm always like, you know what? Things happen for a reason. I, why would this person mention this thing or this person to me? And I just thought about yeah. this last week. You know, it right, doesn't, right, yeah. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't believe in that. You got to listen to that shit. I find is, yeah. as oh get. man. And you there's never listen. a downside anyway. Yeah. You know? A downside? How do you mean? Well, there's never a downside if you oh, listen see, to it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's only like it yeah, may yeah. not. It may not be like a, a you know, the the lottery winnings or something. But like, yeah. there's never a downside for taking. You a got chance. nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah. right. This, this yeah. you know, only good stuff can come out of it. It could be good or average, but it's never like bad. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. same kind of same uh, line of thought. Are there one or two particular things you did that at the time were out of your comfort zone, but hindsight being 2020 they turned into like big breakthroughs for you virtually everything that's, um, that's when awesome. the when when the band broke up because like, i always try to that was one thing that i've always done is put myself in positions that i'm just not comfortable with um 
you know, and just trying to be fearless in that way. When the band, when my band, the Sunday Morning Music Band broke up, uh, we had all these dates. We broke up. The, the guitar player and the keyboard player got in a fight and he was like, fuck you, no, fuck you. And that was it, you know. <laughs> so we had all these dates booked, a uh, handful, and I just kept them. And I played them as a solo guy with an acoustic guitar. And I had never done that before. Oh, wait a minute. You kept the dates. I kept the I kept the gigs, yeah. Because I didn't want to cancel all the gigs. Wow, that is so I was like, awesome. I'm just going to do, do them solo. And there was, um, and then that's when I started doing that. And that was a, that's a whole other era that, you know, and. Um, that is know, really like, impressive, man. That is really yeah, cool. That, sitting on a chair. I was really, do you know who John Martin is? Martin the, with a Y. Yeah, the guy from England who plays. Yeah, uh, acoustic doesn't he yeah plays acoustic sitting down you know uh with an echoplex you know runs it through a twin he's he's one of my favorites of all time and so i was really in the john martin space right then i was like oh this is perfect i'll just do my john martin impression <laughs> for all these gigs but i was terrified you know what i mean because it's you know it's just you strip everything away and it's just you but you know. Pretty vulnerable. It's a vulnerable yeah. spot. Yeah. And then also taught me how to, to accompany myself, but then accompany other people as a solo guitarist, you know, you know, cause I had never done that before, you know, at all. I don't think at all, except for, you know, on the rare occasion of the, like, the, oh, there's an acoustic song in the set or something like that. Hmm. But generally there would always be somebody playing along, you know? And so I did a whole year and a half of just, just playing solo. And then and all I was listening to was Nick Drake and <laughs> John Martin. And I got really into folk music. I love those, uh, especially the first Johnny Cash, uh, you know, American recordings record. Uh, so that, you're like everything you've listened to is the, uh, and then it evolved into Mark Lanigan. It's like a perfect. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. Yeah, you know? yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. That was one of those laws of attraction thing. Cause I was, you know, and then I also went through a, a, you know, a Tom Waits period and a, a Nick Cave period. Mm. And it was just like this kind of dark music mm. I was so, you know, into. And I didn't know how to, um, I, I wanted to do it. But my voice doesn't really lend itself to that, you know. And um, That's surprising because you've, I mean, your speaking voice is great. So I'm. Well, no, I, I, I can sing, but it just, I, I, I don't know. It's just, um, it doesn't sound dark. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 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 uh, 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 you know, I want to sound like Leonard Cohen or something like that. You know what yeah, I mean? It's not I, maybe brooding enough or something. Yeah. Or something. I don't yeah. know. Maybe making all this shit up. But anyways, I, I met Lanigan and then that all was like, oh, well, here you go. This is the perfect yeah. vehicle. That obviously. Yeah. So he was able to help you deliver what you were looking to deliver. Well, he just, he just does what he does, you know? And just, so just playing with him is, it's like, okay, well, there's that. Mm. that that itch is scratched yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean? totally yeah this is the he's the he's the he's the king of the dark the darkness yeah i remember i was in uh it's funny man i remember the first time i heard mark lanigan i was in tower records in new york city where i grew up downtown on uh broadway and west fourth street they had a big flagship store there and yeah. i heard the trees and i'm like what the hell is this man yeah, yeah, and yeah, i was yeah. like i immediately like you know i think it was like if not the first album was the second it was had to be the first album and i bought it and then i just bought every other you know the actual i still have the actual vinyl yeah cool tree man, stuff yeah. So. Right. yeah yeah um so again along the same track going back if you had to give advice to young jeff fielder what advice would you have benefited from um had you been open to listening uh, to get to give to myself yeah uh let's see let me think about that um uh you know there's a it comes with age too but i think it's it, so let's see how i could answer this there's all these things come to my head uh i was a real hot shot guy you know i, I could play at a really early age <laughs> And, you know, everybody just wants to play fast. I love Slash. And, you know, I was I was into metal, man. You know what I mean? Randy Rhodes and all that stuff. And um, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play loud and fast and, you know, and blow people away. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? That guy can shred or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my brother Gary, uh, one of the three, was in a band. He was a singer in a band in, uh, in college. And um, I think it was his – 
graduated law school and he uh, is in San Diego and he had a band. They were kind of like a rhythm and blues type thing. And uh, he's like, hey, you got to sit in with the band. It was like this party. And so I did. And I don't know what I they played some blues song and I just played a million notes and uh, it, it did. It blew everybody away. It's like, wow, you know, the audience was cheering and all that. Uh, but the keyboard player, I could tell, uh, was the most accomplished of all the the guys. And I came up to him. Hey, man, what do you I was real cocky. Hey, man, what do you think? And he goes, eh. <laughs> I go, what? And he's like, yeah, dude, you got to sl- just slow down. You know, don't worry about all those notes. And he he, dr- he gave me a dressing, you know, <laughs> dress me down, you know. And that really stuck with me because I was like, man, hey, man, screw you. You know what I mean? But it really stuck with me for weeks. And I thought, maybe there's something to that. And then the, the more I got into it, I was like, oh, I get it. You know, I didn't know what they meant by slow hand, you know, uh, Clapton. Yeah. You know? And then I was like, oh, I get it. You know, and then you, you, you the one note thing, you know, hearing like, you know, people would always talk about B.B. King, how he could say more with one note than most guys can with a hundred or whatever. Yeah. And that started to dawn on me. And I really, you know, um, and, and I wish it would have a little earlier, like a little bit more because I've still had that kind of attitude where I needed to, um, I felt like I had to prove something, you know, for a yeah, long time. Some of that. So all, you're right. Youth all through my twenties really, you know? And then once I gave all that up was when I became a, you know, somewhat successful musician, you know, because it's not about, you know, it's not about that. It's about music, you know, it's about yeah. the sound, the overall sound. Some of it calls for, you know, a shredding guitar solo, but generally not. Yeah. You know I mean? And, it, you know, and, and especially now, you know, I much prefer listening to a, a guy that can really, you know, really push it. You know, Bill Frizzell comes to mind. Um, uh, um, David Rawlings comes to mind where it's just like, you know, you're just saying, you know, you can do anything, but they choose to kind of bring it way back, you know, and say a lot with very little, you know, and I just, I love that. Yeah. You know? That's great. And, and I, you're, you're that guitarist now for sure. That was really, I was shocked to hear that because you're, 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 you're very melodic, very sonically aware, very tasteful like that. So I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's cool. Um, you talked about some of your guitars a little bit. Um, what's your go-to right now? Well, I kind of have a lot. Uh, the go-to is probably that um, that SG I was telling you about. Yeah. Um, uh, this 1964 SG Special. So that's two P90s and a wraparound. Uh, some of them came with the, uh, the tremolo. Mine didn't. It's got those three holes for the tremolo. And mine didn't have that. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, it's really old. Like It looks really old. It's super checked. And the finish is kind of falling off it, which I, I love that. It's great. Uh, yeah. It's a great guitar. It's never been broken or anything. And it just does everything I want it to do, uh, which is, is great. It's and pretty, it, you know, pretty amazing when you think about that. It's never been broken. It's 54 years old. Yeah. It's, That's it's, it's uh, yeah. amazing. Uh, let's see. And then um, the Telecaster. It's just kind of a, your standard uh, 52 reissue American I think they called it the thin skin or whatever, uh, but it, I got it. I bought it off Craigslist, and I put a uh, Lawler pickup in the bridge and a uh, humbucker in the neck, and um, it's an you know it's just an awesome guitar. Those are my two favorite guitars in general: is a Gibson SG and a Fender Telecaster. I think they both of those things uh, just the two together cover all bases. At yeah. least for, you know what I mean. And the way the SG is designed, that guy that designed the SG is, is the perfect guitar. The way it sits, the way it, you know, the way the neck sticks way out like that. It's an it's an incredible piece. There's one. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love this. This is one of. My, it, I'm not a big guy, and, and it fits my hands like perfectly. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. love that guitar. I've got three. I've got the the '64, and then I've got a 2001 uh, custom shop standard. You know, with the humbuckers. Mm-hmm. It's real good looking. And then I've got a 66 Melody Maker, a palm blue uh, that I've made a slide guitar out of. I put some gold foil pickups in it, and it's a great slide guitar. I love those gold foils, man, and those old harmonies. Yeah. The, uh, what are they? Uh, because the the Armand. The, the Armand, yeah. I love those, yeah. man. They're, yeah. they're beautiful pickups, man. Yeah. Um. Okay, let me ask you now. Who's your favorite guitar player? 
Okay, well, that is a you know loaded question. Uh, yeah, for for this you know? second, I mean, you know, I know tomorrow maybe I five say, new guys. I I always say Peter Green, and then he's so unsung and nobody knows who he is. And I think that he is hands down the best white blues guitar player to come out of that '60s era, and um, just nobody knows Fleetwood Mac. If they, you know, everybody knows Fleetwood Mac, but they yeah. know Steve Fleetwood Mac. Uh, Fleetwood Mac was a band uh, in the '60s, fronted by Peter Green. The reason he named it Fleetwood Mac after the drummer and the bass player because he didn't want to be the guy. You know what I mean? He didn't want to be the, you know, even though he was the guy. His beautiful singing voice, incredible singing voice. The um, the best blues, the best blues guitar player of that of that era. I mean, you're talking about you know Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton. You know, they all came from the same place mm-hmm. from the same time, and. Uh, Peter Green's the he's the guy, and in, in my you know I think he invented hard rock before Zeppelin and um, and Sabbath did for sure. I mean, you've listened to uh, Green Man Mananishi, and, yeah, you know, and that stuff. It's just and uh, you know, oh well. And, did you see and, the documentary? There's a really great that you know, and and the, Man of the world. yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's yeah. on anybody listening. It's on uh, Amazon <clears throat> Prime. That's Peter Green, Man of the World. But what he what he, he named it Fleetwood Mac because he said, I knew I was going to leave the band. Oh yeah. And, and they could carry on without yeah, it. I mean, how nutty is that? I mean, but I mean, they show he's, you know, he's had issues. And I've, I've actually talked to some guys who's, pl- who's played with him and, you know, depending upon when they've played with him, it's like, you know, he was present or not present sometimes, you know, yeah. but, uh, yeah, really soulful, really soulful guy. Um, yeah. definitely had issues. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So Peter Green, uh, uh, John Martin, who I mentioned, Mm -hmm. um, fantastic acoustic guitar player. Um, um, uh, uh, you used to always say that it went in this order. It was Robert Johnson, you know, because he sort of invented modern guitar as, you know, as Mm -hmm. the way I see it. And then the next evolution was Chuck Berry. And then the next evolution was Jimi Hendrix. And then the next evolution was was Eddie, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, they sh- each had an, an era. Yeah, well, they reinvented it every time. Yeah. Or they, they took it somewhere else, you know? Chuck Berry doesn't get enough credit for, you know, inventing rock guitar, you know? No. using Using two strings instead of one, yeah. you know? As opposed to lead lines being sort of like a saxophone would be to use chords, you know, uh, in leads, uh, which was, I can't really think of anybody else that was doing it like that. And he invented all of those licks, man. The Johnny B. Good riff alone is just like, well, ACDC would not exist if it wasn't for Chuck. I mean, they, they're basically electrified. Yeah. 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 So, you know, yeah. It's tough, man. Is there anybody who influences your playing that people would be surprised to hear? Ted Nugent. Ah, interesting. (laughs) <laughs> i love i love those records man i can't help it the dude is skis <laughs> no i love nugent i think he's but a, it was just one of those things great man. Guitar I, player. you know i loved nugent and i loved uh um uh johnny winter was a big one yeah. and i my brothers had these records they had a just wall of records and uh i used to just go pick one and just like kind of blindly pick one and one time it was Johnny Winter and Live. Oh, and that's the, with Rick Derringer yeah. on the second guitar. And uh, man, it blew me away. I listened to that. I wore it out. Wore that record out. I still have it. Um, I had to buy a new copy. I bought like a nice 180 <laughs> copy of it. But uh, I still have the original one. Uh, I just played just endlessly and learned how to play all that stuff on there. I felt like those guys taught me how to play because I would learn by the records, you know. And um, I was doing it all wrong. I found out later, but <laughs> well, that version on that record of Highway Fifty One, one of the greatest, yeah, the greatest best. records Johnny ever, Winter man, is the baddest. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, let's see, one more that would be a surprising uh, influence. Uh, 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 there's somebody in there. I'll think of it in a second. There's somebody I just thought of, and I can't remember right now. But yeah, I'm into guitar. It's <laughs> great. When I was a kid, I used to uh, watch the videos. Like uh, there was a lot of stuff back then. There was a you know the history of rock and roll show. Um, they had these different uh, you know episodes, and they would focus on 
a different subject every time. And then I watched the song remains the same probably a thousand times. You know, movie, just like man. sit really close to the TV <laughs> to see what his fingers were doing. His uh, Jimmy Page's vibrato like really fascinated me. You know, and the, how low he played that Les Paul. Like, oh my god. Crazy. Well, his arms, he's like had these giant gangly arms, man. That's why he did that. Yeah, I still look at that today. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, is that a big deal? You've played with some really great guys. Is there anybody that you like want to play with that you haven't had a chance to yet? Yeah, I'd like to play with Tom Waits. I, don't, I think that ship has sailed, but I would love to be in, in that band. Uh, Mark Rabot is a big uh big influence of, of mine and um yeah this that that just that thing i mean he's you know he's the guy that does that and uh yeah i, l- I would love to to play in that band he's um, another guy who doesn't get enough credit for his yeah, talent he's yeah like, you know. tom waits or mark rabot mark rabot yeah I mean, man just, yeah. you don't hear him enough or you know. yeah there's a there's a, he's one of my heroes just in the way he conducts his career you know what I mean? Because of that, because a lot of people don't know who he is, you know, but oh, yeah. he's like on so many cool records, you know, I just like his, just the way he just does his thing. Him and Buddy Miller is another one of, of my heroes and just kind of the way they conduct their career. Buddy Miller, you know? who did he play with? Why do I know Okay, that? so he's a Nashville guy. Right. And he's most famous recently for doing uh, uh, that kind of resurgence of uh, uh, Robert Plant. So he was in the he was in the band that played on Giant uh, 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 Raising Sand, which is that Robert Plant and Alison Krauss record. Gotcha. And that the every musician that played on that on that record is is the they're the greats, the modern greats, you know. And then when he moved on from that project into Band of Joy, he called it Robert Plant. Uh, Buddy Miller was his uh, band leader. Man, I'm gonna have to get him on the show because I've got tons of contacts in Nashville. And I've heard yeah, his name. So he's the guy. He's the, he's sort of the go to guy in Nashville if they need a house band for like an award ceremony or something like that. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, he's he's a special special kind of guy. I like the guys that nobody knows that nobody or not a lot of people know who they are. You know yeah. what I mean? That well, are just phenomenal. Well, yeah. this is one of those situations. I've heard his name a couple of times. Now you're mentioning me and say, okay, I gotta go find Buddy Miller and get him on yeah, the show. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> desert island discs man again another like impossible question just for right, today right. just for today uh-huh top three okay well uh this is ray charles would be one th- th- you need three of them yeah okay this is ray charles um which is an atlantic records ray charles thing which is great um um we'll do uh, Jimi Hendrix live in Monterey, huh? Interesting. What yeah. makes you pick that one? Because um, it's it's fire, man. You know that's that's and Hendrix landed that day from a, a like it was like a spaceship landed in California, and <laughs> 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 you know if you look at that video, if you look at the rest of the performances, even the Who, you know everybody's buttoned up, sixties, their guitars are all high, you know the birds and all that stuff, and it was the swinging sixties. And then Hendrix just comes out of nowhere, you know, and with a feather boa and a strat and all the feedback and the burning and thrashing everything. And uh, it's amazing, man. I mean, it's absolute magic, you know, that's been recorded. Uh, they recorded it. Thank goodness. I have that. I have to watch that, man. I haven't seen it in ages. I have the whole D.E. Penny Baker set yeah. or whatever. Yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna it's a killer that. concert. But if you put it into context, what? other things were happening at the time yeah you know it's just like he just he just burned it down man he just totally changed everything you know it wasn't just guitar it was fashion it was um you know racial you know yeah it was um it was just like, he's a phenomenon you know Jimi hendrix is much more than a guitar player it's oh like, yeah i mean it's just like he just changed everything and with a you know, with an attitude that's just like, I don't know. Hen- Hendrix is, is uh, otherworldly, you know, he really is. I, I don't think Jimi Hendrix would have had a website either. Yeah. If, if left to his own devices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and number three, let's do, uh, gotta be something mellow. It'd be, uh, Willie Nelson, uh, 
Phases and Stages by Willie Nelson. Wow, what a diverse palette, man. <laughs> All right, tough question, man. Um, what's, what's some of the most important things you learned about yourself through your career experience and through life in general? Uh-huh. Uh huh. I have a tendency for stage fright. That's something that I didn't like. Um, I learned that when I was doing that big tour with Isabel Campbell the first time through um, that t- like, like panic attack type of stage fright. Wow. How do you, how do you uh, like negotiate that with yourself? Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where I don't know if it's going to happen or it doesn't matter the size of the room or the, the crowd and all that stuff. I always get a little nerves before a, a gig, but this different, this is a different thing. It's like paralyzing. Yeah. Uh, and so I've learned how to, uh, I don't do, I don't drink or anything before any gigs or do any, anything else. <laughs> uh, so I play all the gigs really straight. And, um, I, if it's a bigger gig, if it's just a gig around town then I don't take it, you know, I don't take it to this, end. but if it's a bigger gig and it seems like there's a lot riding on it, then I'll, I'll go by myself, you know, off to the side somewhere and I'll just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of half meditation, half pep talk, you know, sure. It's just kind of like, okay, you know, and just like really zen out and just like really calm myself down, you know, and get the, you know, the heart rate down and just try to, you know, zen out yeah, and just be very quiet for a little while and then, and then do the gig, you know? Uh, and it seems to, you know, knock on wood, it seems to be working. You know, that was, that was the drag when I, when I figured out that was a, that was a thing. It was just paralyzing terror. You know, when the show's <laughs> over, are you just like completely wiped out? Like, do you need to just like completely? It, there, there, yeah, but it does take a it does take a lot uh, out of you. I think it's more about after a tour. Some of these Lanigan tours can be pretty long, you know, and you're keeping up a um, a level, you know, every day. You know, they doesn't he take, does he play every day? We don't we don't take a lot of days off. Yeah, I know? don't think so. If we play if we play in a week, we'll maybe have maybe one or two days off, two if we're lucky, you know. That's a lot of work. And so if I get home and it's been a six, seven, eight week tour, uh, that's when it's you know, it's apparent that it's like it's taken a lot out of me. Yeah. You know? And when you're in it, you just kinda keep your head down and you're just in it. But I'll come home and just be man, I'll just be wiped out. It'll take yeah. me at least four days to get back to some sort of level of of normalcy and then also you're moving so much you're physically moving you know oh which knocks like, the shit out of you, you know, physically and it's just yeah. like when you just stop you get home and you just stop moving and it's just like whoa man it really is a thing you know it's a physical yeah healing you know so i learned that <laughs> well it's like running at 100 miles an hour and then you yeah, did exactly. zero you got it you got to like yeah. do some free falling for a little bit yeah i, exactly. I, totally, no, I yeah. totally get that yeah. Um, another thing that I've, what was the, like, what have I learned about myself? Yeah. What have you learned about yourself? Okay. So on the positive side, um, I feel like I can do anything and that, I don't think that that's like bragging. No. You know what I mean, I, I don't want to like, uh, you know, come off like, you know, no, yeah, I can do that. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, to put yourself in situations that are uncomfortable and, and, uh, you know, uh, out of your comfort zone, all the time, you know, kind of constantly, you know, you learn to, to have, you know, even though I have that stage fright thing, you like, as far as the work goes, you know, the music goes, I really feel like, you know, that I'm confident that you can be, you can feel safe if I'm on the gig, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're and, in good hands. It's, uh, it's everything yeah. will be fine. You know what I mean? And it's going to go really well and it will have, you know, because it's, you know, there's a, there's, you need it. Everything needs to be proficient and in tune, but there also needs to be a, a, a magic to it, a fire to it. You know what I mean? And then that's you know that's something that um, that uh, you know I feel like I can do. You know, I I, I never feel um, going into a, any sort of project that I'm like, oh geez, I I don't know if I can do it. You know, or even if I do feel like that, I keep it to myself. You know, what I mean? <laughs> man, but and just that- try to. Yeah. You're the guy you want to be in the foxhole with. So, oh, you yeah, know, that's great, yeah. man. Let me ask you a question about that. You've got a, a tremendous like drive and and work ethic to push yourself. Where did where did you think that came from? Uh, well, um and you've I had mean, it sorry, I mean, you've had that ever since you were very young. 
Yeah, yeah. I think it was just a thing just growing up the you know in Alaska, you know, the, my old man, we don't we don't talk anymore, but he was an influence on me just in the way that he was like, you know, um you know, you got to go to work, man. You know what I mean? You got to get up in the morning and you got to go to work. That's what we do, you know. Mm. And he really instilled that in me. You know what I mean? It's like don't ask for, you know, don't ask for nothing, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, you got to go out and get get yours you know what i mean and it's not like you know it's it's not a greed thing it's just like you know it's just like you gotta you know have integrity get up and go to work you know that was his biggest thing uh another thing about him though was that like he didn't consider music that was like okay well that's a nice hobby you know but you're gonna have to find a job you know a proper job like a be a man you know what i mean that kind of yeah so I kind of like it was kind of both like I had to work through that. There was a long time where I was like, well, this doesn't really matter because it's just, you know, it's just a gig or whatever. And then that was, you know, like, eh, it's really not just a gig. You know, it's you know, the music is important to people. You know, it's important to me. And, um, you know, it needs to be kind of taken, you know, not totally serious. You can't take yourself totally seriously, but you got to take the gig seriously and, and look at it like, you know, like it's a job, like, you know, you well, know, you got to take your responsibility. Friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Exactly. You know, whether yeah. the music's taken seriously, it really is not even up to you, but you got to take right. your, you know, the, the, the obligation you've, you know, raised your hand and willing to assume that's got to be taken seriously. Man. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you got to, you know, you got to be on time and you got to, you know, you got to do what you say, you know, or you're going to do, you know, and that kind of thing. So you know, that goes a long way, you know, I mean, you got to know how to play, but, you know, I think it's, it's, it's almost more important to, you know, just to be, you know, real and, uh, you know, show up, show up and be there and do the, do the thing, you know, it's very important, you know, and in, in, in every, in any kind of work and any kind of thing in your life, you know what I mean? Relationships, oh, I, I, everything else, you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. got to be there, you know what I mean? No, I'm obsessive with that. I, that's yeah, yeah, like yeah. my thing. I, I'm really obsessive with that. Like, and I'm with my kids. I'm like, you know, Absolutely. I don't care what the outcome is here, man, but you fucked up or, you know, you can't, you got to, you agree to do something. You own it, man. You got to do it. You got to give a hundred percent, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Was your mom more supportive of like understanding oh. of like, yeah, hey, I music, you you know, forget about this, not a man stuff. You know, you. This is, <laughs> yeah. She was absolutely a yeah. champion the whole time. Yeah, and then awesome. she was, bless her heart. You know, I had a double bass, uh, double kick drum, uh, drum kit in the basement. You know what oh I mean? My God. Big old half stack. And, uh, you know, and we, she let us make noise, you know, that's and nice, man. It, it was, it was just part of, you know, that was just part of the gig. She was always supportive. And to this day, you know, that's great. Man. And, um, you know, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Yeah, absolutely. Is she in Seattle? No, she's in Denver. I'm the only one in Seattle out of my whole family. Just me and tech. Person who's had the biggest influence on your life, both musically and personally. Mm hmm. You know, obviously two separate people. Or yeah. Well, musically it's either, it's, it's one of three people. It's either Randy McCartney, that music teacher that taught me how to play bass, yeah. my brother Brian, the middle brother, or uh, Dave Aberzies. Those three guys are kind of my main teachers, it seems like, as, mm -hmm. as far as music goes, in, in sort of the different stages. My brother first, you know, just by being around, you know, and playing me records. You know, he wasn't even playing me records. He was just playing records, you know what I mean? He really didn't have all that much to do with me, actually, when I think about it. Although we were in bands later, but, like, he would just, all he had to do was just play in front of me. And I was like, man, that's cool. He just looked cool, you know what I mean? Yeah. Les Pauls look cool, you know? Yeah. He had long red hair and shit, you know? And, you know, he, he, he drove a Challenger. He had a really cool A Dodge orange. Challenger? Those are badass yeah, cars, yeah. man. Yeah, 70. Or no, like 71. Those are cool looking cars. Yeah, that's a cool car. Anyway, uh, so he was a, you know, big thing. And then Randy taught me how to play bass, gave me some discipline, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Dave just, you know, I was starstruck by Dave at first because I obviously knew who he was. Sure. Um, and then um, him just taking me in like that. He really took me in. And uh, he has a studio in Seattle, here in Magnolia where I live. And... Um, Man, he would just he would just just take me in there, and you know, I would mic up a drum kit or I would check a microphone. You know what I mean? I was just always in there doing something. It was almost like I was his intern. But then we would 
you know, we would make songs or we would like bring somebody over. I mean, a couple of times we went out to a bar and found some guy to play bass or something and then bring <laughs> back to the studio, just blow his mind kind of, you know what I mean? Just all of these different things. And it was just like, that was a major education. That was, I'm really thankful for that. So yeah, he was a huge influence, you know? Yeah. And how about personally, who's been the biggest influence on you? Well, Tecla has been a big, yeah. My wife. Yeah. That's nice. She's yeah. That, that's kind of, kind of a game changer, you know, meeting her. She's just like, so supportive and uh, just everything. I, I can't say enough about Tecla. It's weird talking about her because I don't really, you know, do that. <laughs> well, that's good, man. That's like the... she's just like the perfect. You know, when you meet somebody that's just kind of the perfect end. It's just like where you don't know where one begins and the other hmm. starts or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It, I, I do know. What you mean. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of. It's how, really and how long have you guys been together? Well, we've only been together for about three and a half years now. That's plenty um, of time. Man. We've been married for uh, uh, 29 for days. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. That's all That's great. Good. Yeah, yeah. Has, uh, has your life been different than what you'd imagine? Yes and no. You know, I mean, it's weird how things happen where it's like, you know, I want to be, I remember like the, you know, I want to be like, on Johnny Carson or whatever with David Letterman <laughs> back in the day, you know what I mean? And then uh, just thinking, like, when you think of yourself, um, you know, in the future, I don't, you know, you have, like, these, maybe a grandiose idea, of, you know, what it all looks like. Um, so in that way, it's kind of like that because, you know, you get to, you know, we got to open up for Guns N' Roses, man, this last year. You know? That's very cool. That was that was crazy, dude. You, when, when, when with, you were playing... With Lanning, did uh, you know who I had on this show, man? Is the sweetest guy, Richard Fortas. Did you talk with him? Uh, uh-uh. uh. Oh, is From, he w- with with guns? Which guy is he? Well, he's Richard. not. He's the other. He's not Slash. He's the other guitar player. Oh, he's the other guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, cool. yeah. No, he's great. Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, real sweet guy. Was he in? Uh, who's Dead. that dude? Anori Rocks. Was he in that band? No, he was. He's in. He was another band. He was in was Dead Daisies. Okay. Yeah. No, he wasn't in Anori Rocks. Okay. Anyways, yeah, yeah, he was killer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, you know, I mean, like in a way, it did. It turned out kind of, you know, the way I saw it, it just like rock and roll, you know what I mean? Playing guitar, you know, <laughs> hopefully making a living out of it, you know. So that that worked out okay. Um, you know, it's just in the terms of like how it like how, you know, playing with Mark and playing with Amy and doing all these kind of like vastly different, you know, things, you know, that's kind of, you know, a happy surprise, you know. And that is a happy surprise, man. And yeah. you've, you've made it work, which is awesome, you know. And, and uh, thanks. Is that your cat or mine? Yeah, I gotta get him out of here. <laughs> no, she, he's not bothering me one little bit. I just didn't wasn't sure who it was. Did I need to to get mine, or it was I was because mine? Was, I was like, who's cat? Because I got headphones on. I'm like, wait a minute, is that mine? Right, because right, right. he's like loud as shit. So it could have been even with the head. Um, you have any hobbies or interests outside of music, Jeff? Yeah, well, I draw. I. Uh, I'm really into cartoons. Awesome, man. I could have gone that way when I was a kid. I was, I was so into it. That was the two things I was into was music and art and specifically sort of illustration. You know, I really, I love, uh, the sixties comics, you know, like zap comics. Oh my God. Like crumb. Robert crumb. Oh yeah. That guy's awesome. I love that. There's a forum. There's a couple of groups in Facebook. I'm in, they have that. And it's like, it's really cool. They show stuff like that all day long. Yeah, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. So there was a resurgence of that uh, uh, about ten years ago. I started drawing again. Uh, these on the back wall at mine. I, you and, know, what? Uh, I was looking at yeah, those and yeah. I was wondering what that was. You've drawn yeah. all those. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So wow. I'm really into it. And there was a time, kind of recently, I was doing art shows and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then I got really busy with music. About you know more more so than I was before about five years ago. And I haven't really drawn since. I have one up on here. It was my last one I did. I was going to do a whole series. Uh, but it's all pen and ink, you know. It's That's that, great. I try to keep like in the kind of cartoony vibe, you know. And I, I just love art, you know. I, I go to art shows and galleries and uh, museums all the time. You know, it's, traveling is just great for that. Yeah. You know? So, you know. Do you use like all. a rapidograph? Like what, I don't know, even know what that is. It's like uh, those <laughs> things with the needle point. Are you probably, Now it's like not popular because they have fine – point pens that are really yeah, small the, the pens yeah, yeah. But i was using a the old school pen and ink like dipping the old school quill in the whatever they call that you know what i mean well dude check this out yeah. i write uh, with these i don't know if you could see this 
Yeah, yeah. yeah That's I, what I'm talking I, about. Yeah, I write with fountain pen. Right. That's funny, man. But cool. I write. I just put this aside because I ran out of ink. I got to juice it up. <laughs> That's really cool, dude. I smell. Uh, well, now because you're Jeff Fielder, your paintings, your drawings are worth more. Well, we'll see. Yeah, they yeah. are, man. <laughs> um, tell me about. We got two more, three more questions. A specific experience that changed your life or changed the way you think about things. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Traveling. Just traveling in general. Uh, you know, I told you about that first tour with Isabel yeah. and everybody else in the band. The The guys in the band uh, were mostly from Denmark. Hmm. Um, they were from Denmark and Scotland. And then me and Mark were the two Americans. Um, and uh, first of all, just hanging out with all those guys. You know what I mean? All the, that, that, that experience, you know. And then we would be traveling around and I would just constantly be staring out the window, just kind of in awe, like a little kid. And they were yeah. making me like, look at him, man. <laughs> but it's, but just traveling, it gives you such a sense of, you know, the world, yeah. you know, all, there's so many people, man. Yeah. <laughs> and things and are so the, different really all over. Yeah. And just the really cultures cool. and, you know, and the, the one thing that I really took away from that most, the, the, biggest thing i took away from it is that you're seeing the world through the eyes of a of a rock and roll band you know what i mean so you're in all these different countries and all these different places all around the world you know australia and africa and israel and turkey and you know all over europe and all over south america you know and it's all these different countries and all these different religions and and different attitudes about things and then you show up to the gig and there's the stage with the PA with the sound sound guys are the same all over the world dude <laughs> you know what i mean you know and then people show up and they want to they want to hear the the tunes and they love rock music and just you know and then just that sort of lifestyle and all that stuff and then you just you see the humanity in it you know and how it really is all the same you know once you once you strip away all the stuff you know you know people in general just want to get on with it and have a good time you know yes and it's it's beautiful i mean that was the biggest takeaway is just it's just like all the traveling and being able to do it consistently every year year after year after year and going these places again you know going to you know i mean i've been to istanbul five times or something like that you know it's crazy you know and every time you take away something else from it, you know, and, um, you know, um, and that's, I think that, you know, if anybody can do anything to expand their mind, it's, it's, it's traveling, you know, yeah. and, and seeing other cultures and seeing them for what they are, you know, and not trying to put yourself into it. Well, I think blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. kind of let it, let it happen, you know, let it, you know, you know, and then it, it, learn from it, you know, let, let people teach you something. Yeah. Also. You know what I mean? I, I totally know what you mean. And again, because I grew up in New York, I love, I, and all I grew up with with people from, I, from other places. Every time I have an opportunity to have somebody from out of the country on the show, I pursue them. Or I, like I, I found out about this great blues guitar player and he was Indian. I'm like, holy shit, they got a yeah, blues yeah, guitar. Yeah. And so I, I reached out to him right away and I said, hey man, you know, I think he had liked the post or followed me on Instagram. And I said, dude, I just checked you out. I'd love to have you on my show. And cool, he was yeah. a cool dude. And it's like, you know, we're talking on FaceTime and he's in India. It's like 2 a.m. there. I don't, it was just so like, so now he's coming on the show. I'm like, man, I didn't know they had a blues scene. He goes, well, if you'd like, I, you know, I would love to refer you to other guys that are in the blues scene. Yeah, here. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. wow, that's great. You know, cause I, like, I always feel like I could learn something from yeah. him that I can't learn from a guy who's another guy from New York or another guy sure. from, from from portland or denver you know the, i'll his vantage right. point's totally different yeah you know and yeah. i'm looking forward to hearing that because he can help help hopefully make me smarter which is not too hard <laughs> but, you know <laughs> what, what is what's your favorite place you've traveled oh gosh um i think the most the place that really changed my life kind of was africa so south africa and just being you know in that nature thing it wasn't really a gig thing it was more of you know just being there and um I mean, it was the, I was I was working there, but it was we had a lot of time to to really take it in, you know, and go on safari and all that stuff. And you're back. You feel like you're back, you know, in a way, you know, your 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 senses are heightened. You know, you can hear things that you didn't think you could hear, you know, just like because you're out in it with animals. You know what I mean? Hanging out with tigers and or not tigers, but lions and, and elephants and 
and uh, it was really a trip, man. You there know? No, it, there's no tigers there. I'm just curious why you backed off. There, of there's no tigers. They're they're, they're in the, the yeah. northern part of the yeah, uh, India, the northern part of Africa. Yeah. Interesting. But um, man, what a what a trip that was. Uh, other than that, I love Amsterdam, and not because of the reasons that you think, but that doesn't hurt. But All I thought was the good music. <laughs> there's something <laughs> quaint about the Netherlands that I just love it. If if I had to move to to the, uh, Europe, it would probably be to Amsterdam, Amsterdam or Rotterdam, or somewhere in the Netherlands. I, I really really like it there. I've interviewed yeah. guys from the Netherlands, Sweden, and um, they're all very cool people, man. Really, yeah, really nice guys, man. Yeah, Scandinavia would be cool. It's just really cold, and I've already I've already been to Alaska and done all that. So, well, you're in you Seattle. Know. It ain't warm. Well, yeah, but it ain't you know it ain't crazy like that. Oh, it's you know, not- we don't get that the, the snow and ice like they do. Oh, in it, Oslo, man, it's, it's- Oslo's the coldest place I've ever been. Oh, you don't get <laughs> snow in Seattle? Sometimes it's, it's not it's not like a thing. I mean, it might snow. Oh, in I didn't January. know that. Yeah. Oh, I thought. Oh, I didn't know that, man. It's a beautiful place. I was there once. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I like it here. Hey, man. Last question. I can't thank you enough for your time. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and how much is just a part of aging? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's that sort of humility thing in in, in playing. Certainly it's just sort of like centering everything, you know, and getting a little less about, Hey, look at me. And a little bit more like, you know, into the music and the song, you know what I mean? And, uh, and finding a voice in that. There's a voice to be had in the, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people are like, well, then I don't get to do my thing, you know? Um, for me, it was like, that's when I really did, I found a voice in there. You know what I mean? That's kind of um, what I do in a way now, you know? And it's much, it's much more pleasant for me. Uh, and that in turn um, spilled over into just life in general. You know what I mean? Just that's taking great. everything taking everything easier, you know what I mean? Allowing uh, other people's influence to, you know, re- to really be a thing. It's kind of like when, uh, y- you know, that old, old adage of you're just waiting for them to stop talking so you can talk, you know what I mean? Like losing that completely, you know, and just like really being in the moment. Um, and so that, you know, it was music first and then it kind of spilled over into into just life, you know, it's just being, you know, just more present and, 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 uh, you know, uh, grateful, you know, for every day and all that kind of thing, you know what I mean? And really, really, uh, you know, appreciating everything that, that is around us, you know, whether it's like, you know, your career is going well or, or not, or just, you know, whether your relationship is going well or not, just, you know, just trying to see the good in things, you know, and not dwell on the, the, all the bullshit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, there's plenty of that. <laughs> oh, there's too much of that, man. You kidding? Man, I can't thank you enough for everything. Um, man, I, I wish you tons of years and years of happiness with Tecla, the two of you guys, and I uh, hope thank everything you. that's going your way keeps going your way. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, let me tell people where they could find you. First of all, it's Jeff Fielder. Please check out his playing. This guy is a really um, – just a very melodic guy and whatever he's doing, it just sounds great. A uh, few ways you could find him. First of all, um, look him up online on YouTube. You'll see a ton of his stuff, but uh, he's been with Mark Lonigan for quite some time and their stuff is really amazing. He's currently going out with Amy Ray. They're doing a fall tour throughout the country, actually coming to Florida, believe it or not. But uh, and find that uh, nobody comes here. It's just like the booth. It's like always, it's hard to come here and, you know, I get it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's Amy, A-M-Y-Ray.com, Amy-Ray.com, and the, her, the full tour is on there. Um, uh, you could find Jeff on Facebook. Uh, he will not post anything, but he is on Facebook. And- <laughs> <laughs> I put up the important things. Yeah, yeah. No, put hey, up- man, I used to be pretty active, and then I just like – He I puts just, up his gigs. Like- I'm out. Hey, do <laughs> do what makes you happy, you know? Seriously, like, you know, okay, fine, you know, was, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um he he also check out his wife's record. He just produced her. Her name is Tekla, T E K L A Waterfield and uh, her 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 website's Tecla Waterfield, and she's got a vinyl of the record. It's available everywhere: Apple, iTunes, Spotify. She's a great singer songwriter. And Jeff, did you play on that record? I know you produced it. Yeah, I played. I played every instrument on that record. We Dude, brought in a drummer. You're a beast. And there was there was uh there was um uh some keyboard stuff that I couldn't do. Uh, so we brought in my man Dan Walker to play some 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 of the keyboards, but I played m- most of the keyboards. 
Uh, and then uh, that string arrangements from uh, uh, Andrew Jocelyn, who's a genius uh, around here. And he did the strings, but I helped him arrange the strings. And then other than that, yeah, I played, I played everything. I played bass, guitar, keyboards, Mellotron, uh, what, a little percussion, sang the backups. You know what I mean? It Dude, was cool. Awesome. Yeah. Program the drums. There's some drum programming in there. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Do not get in, do not get in Jeff Fielder's way, and, <laughs> but he is the guy you want to be in the Foxholes. And also, he wanted me to mention uh, Lonigan's last record that he didn't play on. It was like a a project with Duke Garfield, who's Duke, a guitar Duke player. Garwood. Duke Garwood. Garwood. Sorry about that. Sorry, Duke. Duke yeah. Garwood. It is a project, and uh, that they've played together. All three of these guys have played together. But um, the record's called With Animals, and Jeff said to check that out. It's a really great album. It's, it's getting tre- record, tremendous right. reviews, and I'm going to check it out myself because I have not listen yet man any final words of wisdom anything i missed uh you know just keep on keeping man you know we got this <laughs> you know life love music you know it's this is all important you know so um you know just keep your head up and you know keep rock on, on smiling i appreciate it man. <laughs> everybody thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed this interview please share it with a friend on your social media channels we certainly appreciate your support and thanks again to Jeff Fielder for spending time with us. Uh, please check him out on. He's a beautiful guitar player, man. Very soulful, incredibly melodic. I love his stuff with Mark Lonigan. It's really uh, and really great stuff. And uh, make sure you go to the homepage of everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 